<clears throat> Hello folks, how's everybody doing? Hope you're doing fine. We have another glorious extinction day today. <laughs> so if you don't want to get your mood down, well, stick around. You might learn something, okay? Anyways, I'm going to start directly. I'm going to jump in directly with a uh, couple comments that were made. And that sets the tone for what I'm going to be discussing today. So here goes the first one. And uh, this fellow says, um, We can provide essential staple food for all at a fraction of the average worker's current take-home pay, which would not require unsustainable taxation or hyperinflation. What is he referring to? He's referring to my theory that says that humans will become extinct when food is no more. Food is no more when the economy collapses, meaning that trade will be no more. In other words, money will no longer have any value. That's what I was, that's the theory, and this is what his uh, reply is, okay? He's going to analyze this. Paying other costs like rent, mortgages, etc. is a bigger challenge. Uh, it's more likely we'll see mass homelessness, loss of transport, heating, etc. before mass starvations in the aftermath of this pandemic. Though food distribution and processing could be an issue. And he followed that up with another set of comments here. Farmers always have an incentive to grow food for future income because some form of payment will be of value in the future, even if some currency is devalued. They would seek government assistance if necessary to do this, and governments will prioritize support. If there is a shortage of farm workers, governments would introduce short-term incentives to make farm work worthwhile. In the medium long term, more farm work is going to be automated, making food production cheaper. Okay? The true cost of a resource reflects the human effort required to produce it, which for food is not going to increase. Unsustainable farming practices should gradually self-correct, trend to organic, new sustainable methods, uh, as the cost of unsustainable practice will start to rise. Okay? Uh, no mention of the dinosaurs there. That, uh, that struck me a little bit, you know. Uh, you would think uh, this fellow would have uh, mentioned something about the Permian synapses or uh, the um, dinosaurs or someone, uh, Cretaceous dinosaurs. No mention of that. He just went in there and uh, talked about humans. And I've got the same situation with another set of comments here, a couple comments here. And this fellow says, uh, the fact that we live in a service-based society means more of us can live substantially better lives versus his Paleolithic ancestors, assuming my <laughs> ancestors. We certainly live longer lives, yes. And that's one of the signs that we're ready for extinction, when we live longer lives. And I've covered that in the past. I uh, won't go into that in any depth today at least. In fact, the service sector is the largest sector in the world. Even Bill acknowledges this. Yes, absolutely. And that's that's the problem. <laughs> A virus pandemic, uh, especially of this magnitude, will be all but forgotten in five to ten years from now. Let us hope. Cross our fingers, right? Hope to die. Uh, yeah, the, the problem there is that the service sector, I've already covered that. I'll just uh, briefly put the... Um, graph that gives you, puts it in a proper context, okay? And here's the context. The context is that we were hunter-gatherers for more than 100,000 years. Uh, 10,000 years we did farming uh, when we uh, domesticated uh, both plants and animals. For the last 200 years, maybe 300 years, we were in a manufacturing revolution, industrial revolution. And I think it was 1979 when we switched, when, when services took over and uh, became the dominant mode of production, uh, displacing both manufacturing and farming, not to mention hunter-gathering. <laughs> so yeah, as you can see, the uh, timelines are decreasing. It's an exponential process. And the uh, question is, what comes after services? I mean, if we have a service economy now, are we going to be doing services for the next million years 
Are we going to have, uh, like I say, uh, more bakers and fewer farmer, uh, fewer uh, bankers one year, and uh, I don't know, more uh, waiter waitresses and fewer cashiers another year? Is that what we're going to be doing? We're just going to be uh, putting people in different categories of services for the next million years. And uh, no, uh, services uh, first. It's the last mode of uh, uh, the human economy. There is nothing coming after services. You can imagine because we've done it all from manufacturing to services, agriculture. We've we've done it all. And the other problem is services is unemployment. Uh, services is mass unemployment and I showed the example the other day where uh, what do we have now 30 million people unemployed in the United States uh, they went to the unemployment office to ask for uh, help from the government and we didn't even notice it why didn't we didn't <laughs> we didn't notice it because a lot of those were worker hotel workers uh, restaurant workers maybe airline employees and so on and we don't need that. We don't need any of those services. Those are luxuries. Tourism is luxury. And, you know, I give the example of God looking down from heaven, you know, at the earth. And what does he see? He sees what we built, what is uh, real. <laughs> well, he sees the buildings, the skyscrapers, the, you know, the streets, the highways. Uh, he sees also the farming stuff, you know, he sees the... Um, uh, all the uh, what is it um, all the uh, uh, fields uh, corn fields wheat fields rice fields he sees all that what he doesn't see is services he doesn't see banking he doesn't see insurance he doesn't see any of that he doesn't see entertainment <laughs> all that is is unnecessary so we live in a luxury economy we live in an unnecessary economy and yeah we unfortunately most of our economy today is services that is the problem services is another way of saying unemployment so uh, how much services can contribute to the economy well I don't know they, they don't produce anything per se what we produce is true services we make manufacturing and agriculture run that's how it works okay and uh, services per se doesn't produce anything it's just promises you know what is an insurance policy it's a promise there's nothing there <laughs> you know uh, and that's why I call all these people Disneyland economists you know they, they follow Milton Friedman and uh, uh, Adam Smith you know everyone pursuing his own self-interest pushes the uh, world forward yeah only only if uh, you have a job and when you don't have a job well then the government sends you a paycheck <laughs> like it did the other day and um, if it were so easy I mean they, they should just continue giving us paychecks right uh, in fact I would love the US government to give everybody a million dollars imagine everybody received a million dollars hey uh, we've got it made right we don't have to worry about anything anymore do we <laughs> yeah why doesn't they do why don't they do that well they don't do that because there there's a cost just giving money away is a cost and until people understand that you know they won't understand anything but what is my objection to these fellows and by the way most people I think think like them okay so I'm in the minority and I realize that uh, but I'm gonna defend my point <laughs> and let me tell you the the issue the issue here is that these people talk about uh, extinction 102 and they don't want to cover extinction 101 see you need a prerequisite to talk about extinction before you can talk about extinction 102 you have to deal with extinction 101 and you say what the hell are you talking about bill what's <laughs> what's all this 101 102 stuff well you know when you go to college you have these 101 courses they're prerequisites of 102 and 110s and other courses that come afterwards right and uh, 101 is like an introductory course and yeah, before you can talk about human extinction, extinction 102, you need to talk about extinction, which is extinction 101. You need to understand the basics of extinction. And I've got all these experts on human economy. Everybody's an expert on that because everybody's an expert on their own opinion and politics. That's what everybody does. Nobody wants to do research and really figure out something about 
extinction per se. So you ask them something about the Permian, they don't even know how to spell that word. You know, and so they don't even know what animals existed in those days, what plants existed. And it's like, you know, you tell them, well, how did they die? Well, let me look it up. <laughs> and they'll look it up and they'll go to the bozos that come out of Harvard and Cambridge universities and those people have never figured it out. 200 years no one has figured out extinction. Not one single paleontologist. That's why I have very little respect for any paleontologist on earth. I have very little respect for that whole profession. Because a lot of people think that a paleontologist is a person who goes out into the field, uh, looks for bones, right, in the rock, uh, finds one, dusts it off, gives it a fancy name, assembles it, puts it in the museum and starts charging, uh, you know, uh, starts selling tickets. No, that's a stamp collector. That's not a paleontologist. Paleontologist has only one job and one job only. When he figures that out, paleontology is no more. We don't need paleontology anymore. A paleontologist is tasked with discovering how the animals in the past died, how they became extinct. That's his only purpose in life. Once we figure that out, we don't need paleontology anymore. Okay? So all this stuff about collecting bones and dusting them, giving them fancy names, that's, that's stamp collecting. Okay? And all we have today on planet Earth are stamp collectors. We have no paleontologists. Okay? Now you know where I'm coming from on this. Okay, so uh, why don't we start with a little um, picture, a big picture of what happened in the past. I'm going to cover Extinction 101. I want to know how the animals in the past died before I can talk about man. And what's the, uh, what's the uh, logic here? The logic is that, you know, uh, if I can figure out how uh, animals died in the past, maybe I can figure out that there's a cookie cutter, that, you know, uh, it's a repeatable process, and that all of these uh, animals died in the same way. And if that's the case, we can extrapolate that mechanism to humans. Okay, we extrapolate it to humans and find out if man can avoid that same mechanism. Okay, you get my logic here, my reasoning. And uh, so when you go into the past, well, uh, what I find is that uh, animals died all in the same way. Mass extinctions and also background extinction. So there's two forms of extinctions that Mother Nature has. Background, which is when a single species dies, and a mass extinction when many species, usually a family or an order, goes away. And uh, Mother Nature has only two mechanisms, one for mass extinction, one for background extinction. And that's not what you find in the record, in the uh, literature. What you find in the literature is ad hoc mechanism. You find one mechanism per species. So if it's in the air, well, who knows what happened to them. Maybe uh, uh, brim fire and brimstone rained down on them, you know? Or maybe they, they ran out of air. Maybe uh, the carbon and nitrogen cycle somehow affected the birds. How about the ones in the sea? Well, there was acid rain and it fell and it uh, poisoned the waters. Some died and some lived. Competition. Uh, how about those on land? Well, who knows? Maybe it was an asteroid. Maybe it was a volcano, volcanoes, volcanic activity. Maybe it was a supernova. So they have all these different theories to explain, especially uh, catastrophic events, why something happened so suddenly uh, as recorded you know, in the rock layer. And so they have to come up with catastrophic theories because they never thought of anything else. Okay, well, that's what I'm going to debunk. I'm going to show that no, Mother Nature is a simple lady, okay? Very simple lady. She does things very simply, and it's all very natural. We don't have catastrophic accidents involved in any mass extinction. That's what I'm going to argue today, okay? So let's go with uh, Extinction 101. Let's see, here we have a little snapshot uh, of um, certain relations. We had certain types of plants in different eras, okay? And uh, for each uh, plant, you had certain types of animals. Uh, here I start at the Carboniferous, and what you see there, the first one on the left, is a, um, an amphibian. 
From there, we went to these uh, weird animals that had a sail back. Uh, this was Edaphosaurus there, and uh, they ate something different than the, um, the ones in the Carboniferous because the plants changed in great measure. Well, the plants kept changing and the animals kept changing for some reason. You have uh, the next one, a Pariasaur. Uh, that's uh, the guy that's going to finish off the uh, Permian. And there's a certain type of plant that was very abundant in those days and also disappeared at the end of the Permian, just uh, by sheer coincidence. And again, I'm only looking at the uh, land animals here. Then you can have the age of the Triassic, the archosaurs. Uh, they were crocodile-like uh, animals that um, could move a little faster on land than uh, crocodiles can today. And, um, and they were tied to certain plants. Uh, then we had, you know, the Jurassic, the big long necks are very famous for that period. Different type of plant altogether. Uh, Cretaceous, same thing. Uh, we had uh, uh, the conifers uh, were on their way out, and when the uh, conifers were on their way out, we came along, uh, the last one there, and the grasses came into being. And today, 87% uh, of what we produce or eat is our grasses, including, and that uh, also feeds the same mammals that we eat. Okay, so that's a snapshot. You can see that animals, to some degree, are related to certain types of plants. If you name a certain type of plant, in the past, uh, for sure you're going to have certain types of animals associated with that and not others. Okay, so uh, somehow animals and plants go together. And that should not surprise you because uh, when a plant, certain, uh, certain types of plants evolve and expand throughout the landscape and they form like the majority of plants, well, the animals that are going to carve niches in, in those plants you know, uh, they're going to, uh, they have nothing else to eat, so they have to do that. And so one animal eats this plant, another one eats that plant over there, and they form these dynasties, and they evolve. The plant evolves, they evolve, and over the millions of years, you have these new, these new species evolve. And at some point, those plants have to go out. They have their cycle. And people are not aware of that. You know, they say no, plants continue forever. Well, you you just saw that plants did not continue forever. And the question is why? I mean, why don't we still have a uh, Cooksonia, a uh, plant that just came out of the water, way out there in uh, millions of years ago? And uh, you know, Cooksonia is not around today, except in the uh, rock. You can see it there. Maybe you see other plants that came after, also in the Carboniferous. Uh, in the uh, Permian, and they no longer exist. And so we have their fossil records; they're now no longer around. You say, "Well, what happened to them? Why didn't? Why don't they? Why don't these plants still exist today? If plants live forever?" And yeah, what people fail to see is plants um, have their population curve as well, long-term population curve, and then they die. They become old and they die. What does old mean? It means that after millions of years of inbreeding, they finally uh, lose genetic diversity. And at some point, they become numerous old, and then they die in mass. And when they die in mass, all those animals that forge relationships with those plants, they go with them. And this is another thing people don't understand. They say, well, the animal will start eating something else. So he was eating, I don't know, seed ferns. Well, the animal, the animal says, well, there are no more seed ferns around. I think I'm going to start eating conifers. Or maybe I'll eat the grasses or whatever's out there. It doesn't work that way. First of all, they don't have their stomachs ready for that new plant. It's poison for them, just like for you eating ferns. No one eats ferns. No mammal eats ferns. I mean, there might be, I think there's one exception out there, or a couple that uh, developed, found a way of eating it. But, you know, mammals in general don't eat ferns because it's poisonous for us. It's, it, you know, it doesn't do any good. It's like eating uh, weeds. Do you eat weeds? And those are angiosperms. <laughs> so if you don't eat weeds, much less are you going to eat, uh, you know, uh, ferns or uh, conifers for that matter. We don't eat Christmas trees. Uh, leaves, you know, we don't eat those. <laughs> I mean, I don't at least. <laughs> I don't know about you. So, uh, no, animals don't, uh, don't just switch overnight and say, you know, the rabbit's eating lettuce and says tomorrow, ah, I think I'm going to start eating pine leaves. 
No, it doesn't work that way, okay? Plants are not plants are not plants. There are plants and there are plants, okay? And animals are, are smarter than humans. They know the difference. They know what they like. They know what they don't like. And even if they can eat something else, it usually makes them sick or kills them. So they have to be very careful as well on that side. You know, they, they've got every animal has his food, the food he likes the most, okay? They can't switch overnight because suddenly uh, some, certain plants are missing. Okay, so let's go. Uh, uh, before that, well, uh, let me just cover this. I want to show a big picture also what happened in the seas. I'm not going to cover the seas today, but I just want to show the big picture, okay? So did you get a feel for why food is important, okay? And here you have it, okay? This is, this is uh, a map that I made, okay? And it shows that we had really uh, three big regions, okay? And those, uh, or eras, you could say, in time, regions in time. And uh, I call them the age of trilobites, the age of ammonites, and the age of krill. Today, in this day and age, we live in the age of krill, you could say. What am I saying here? Well, you have the uh, uh, plankton, and these animals are kind of like the middlemen. You know, they're, they're small animals, uh, and they take care of the plankton, and then other animals eat the uh, trilobites, the ammonites, or the krill. That's the way it works. So, so uh, these are pretty good markers for different um, layers of rock, uh, how many trilobites or where the trilobites were, how they evolved over time. We have quite a bit of information on these animals. And as you can see in the case of trilobites, you know, there were many species and many families, many orders of trilobites. You know, a trilobite's not a trilobite, it's not a trilobite. There are trilobites and there are others that are trilobites. <laughs> They're different, okay? And each one of those uh, fingers that are pointing outwards shows you approximately when these different uh, orders of trilobites appeared and how they disappeared. And you can see on the bottom graph uh, in pink there um, how they dwindled over time. And eventually they ended up becoming extinct exactly at the uh, Permian-Triassic boundary. Okay? Coincidence? Uh, well, that's where many of the uh, sea creatures died at the end of the Permian. Okay? So it wasn't only land animals. It was also in the seas. And yeah, you can see not only that the numbers decrease, but you can also see that the number of species the, or the orders uh, came down. We ended up with only one order in the end uh, that lasted until the Permian. That was it for all the trilobites. Same story for the age of Ammonites. The Ammonites, you know, they started in the Devonian, but they really became prominent in the uh, Jurassic, in the, in the Mesozoic. And um, what happened there? Well, what happened was you had different species, different families also. And towards the end there, I showed just a couple numbers. Um, in the last 30 million years, they went from 19 families to 11 to finally two. Only two families finished, you know, the, uh, the race. Very similar to the trilobites. And what am I saying? I'm saying that, well, you can't produce these kinds of graphs with asteroids and or with uh, volcanoes and this is the problem the problem is that uh, you see the graphs there people are aware of it in paleontology but it's like they don't pay attention to them and they start looking for uh ridiculous theories to try to explain you know the disappearance of these animals when it's very clear that they're disappearing gradually over millions of years and the age of krill, which is our age now, they started also around 130 million years ago. That's the best estimate they have. But they beca became uh, prominent after the collapse uh, of the KT at the KT boundary. Uh, that's when they started to expand. And to this day, you know, krill is that middleman that serves between the... Uh, uh, plankton and bigger animals. And in the last uh, 30 years, we had a 70% decline. So that gives you an idea uh, in, in the population of krill. And so that gives you an idea that we've got a little bit of a problem that we're facing in the seas today because uh, that's very indicative of a, um, of a mass extinction in, the, in, in progress. And again, 30 years is nothing uh, from a geological standpoint, okay? So that just gives you a picture of what happened in the seas, a very general picture. 
and you know you, you should ponder that you know it, it, the pattern is there and it's got to do with food it doesn't have anything to do with asteroids volcanoes you know the trial the uh, the krill they're they're disappearing before our very eyes and no one knows why they they have this well it's the climate that's what that's what else are the what is a what else is a paleontologist going to say he doesn't know any better so he's going to say it's the climate uh, like this fellow I talked to the other day, Guy, Guy McPherson, you know, it's the climate. They think it's the climate. No, no, it's uh, the krill has had its, uh, its cycle. And now it's time for krill to die. Krill is an old species. It's been around for 130 million years. If we look at the numbers uh, that they uh, speculated on. And if we accept those numbers, yeah, it's an old species, uh, uh, old uh, type of animal, right? Even though there's many species, many families, uh, and it's on its way out. It's just that simple. And when it's on its way out, you know, what's going to replace it? Well, the first problem is that plankton is also on its way out. There's a lot of plankton out there, diatoms and so on, that are having problems today. The krill are having problems. And guess what? That's the bottom of the food chain for the seas, okay? Keep that in mind. Oh, that's all I can tell you. It's got something to do with food. <laughs> Whatever anyone else tells you. Okay, so what is my uh, my proposal? I'm saying, well, you know, the biblical story. Here's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I'm going to say that third horse from the left, the black horse, uh, famine. Uh, that's the guy that's going to do it. And this is what he looks like when he comes around. It's not, it's not going to be any of the others. Uh, <clears throat> which is war and death and pestilence. Now it's this guy. It's the uh, um, guy who carries the balance, okay? Because you had, to, you had to put the scale, you had to put things on the scale to weigh things to uh, trade. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, it's the horseman, black horseman, the guy that does starvation because he's, he's going to, essentially, the reason he's carrying the scale is that's where you put food and gold and so on to, you know, to do, make the trade, okay? And so that's the symbol for starvation. And, yeah, I think it's going to be the third horseman that's going to kill us. It's not going to be war. No, uh, war, if anything, helps. You know, it just adds. But no, it's going to be starvation because we're not going to produce food or dist distribute it. And right now, we all depend on someone else producing the food and distributing it to us. See, that wasn't the case in the Upper Paleolithic where you had, uh, you know, uh, everybody doing his own thing. Uh, the clans went out there, hunted something that was on the plains. You know, maybe they hunted, uh, you know, a mastodon or a mammoth or whatever or some other animal. Uh, and they brought it to the cave, they slaughtered it, and they all ate, and they lived another day, and that's, or a couple days at least. <laughs> and so that's the way it was in those days. They were in direct contact with the food supply. That's one issue. The other issue is they were in Eden. They were in Eden because they're, they couldn't hunt all the animals that were available. There were too many animals available uh, pound-wise, right? Uh, compared to the number of people that lived upon them. So they, it's like the... Um, the um, American Indians, like the Sioux, you know, they had all these buffaloes. They couldn't kill them all. There were a million buffaloes. And these guys were a few thousand. And so they didn't, they had no chance of killing millions of buffaloes. Okay? They had no chance whatsoever. So they would go out there, hunt one, kill them, eat, and they would continue living on and on and on because the supply was essentially infinite as far as they were concerned. They had all these buffaloes they could hunt want any time they want it. We don't have that situation. Here we live day to day, mouth to mouth. You know, uh, we, don't, we don't store food for seven years like the uh, biblical pharaohs did allegedly, you know, storing grain and so on. We don't store grain for seven years, okay? Now what we do is we produce food upon demand. You know, uh, you go to a restaurant, you don't have to wait seven years. No, they bring you the food within minutes. <laughs> at least in most restaurants, maybe not in McDonald's or whatever. Okay, um, and so yeah, it takes. Uh, uh, the, we we don't we don't store food for years. Okay, we don't have a supply of food for eight billion people uh, for the la next seven or ten years. No way. And so yeah, uh, once uh, we stop producing, food shuts down like today. That's it. You know, it's not like you're going to get some more unless someone plants something and distributes it. 
So uh, keep that in mind. That's not the case uh, with the Paleolithic people uh, because, you know, they had ample supply of food, essentially infinite uh, uh, meat there. Okay? And by the way, those spears, uh, they weren't used to hunt lettuce or tomatoes or pull apples from the trees. No, uh, they hunted. Yeah, we were meat eaters, okay? I know vegetarians don't like to hear that, but yeah, we were meat eaters for most of our existence. And we just became vegetarians to some degree, uh, maybe 10 to 15,000 years ago when we domesticated plants, okay? Okay, so uh, what's the mechanism I propose? Here it is, the overturning of the population of the ecological pyramid. The one on the left is a healthy one where you have a few uh, 10 to 1 ratio between primary production uh, to herbivores. There's a 10 to 1 ratio there. And there's a 10 to 1 ratio between herbivores and predators. That would be an ideal pyramid. And what happens uh, in a mass extinction, uh, that pyramid gets overturned. You got uh, little primary production. The herbivores are starving and they're preyed upon by a bunch of predators who soon lose uh, their source of food because they liquidate everything in sight. Okay, so this is the mechanism I'm proposing. And uh, so let's look at uh, what happened in the past. Let's look at one um, era at a time, one, one, uh, period, one time period at a time. Here's the Carboniferous, and you get an idea. I'm, I'm just going to uh, give some ideas. I can't cover all the details of all the animals that existed, okay? Just give you some examples to show you that you got to pay attention to food or at least ponder it or, or factor it in uh, your analysis of extinction, at least Extinction 101 of the animals in the past, okay? Here's the first one, and this is the Carboniferous. There was a, what is known as the rainforest collapse 305 million years ago. And these are the uh, commons. They, they, they come out of the Wikipedia, but um, this comes out of the literature, okay? So it's, uh, it's got authority, you could say. Not that we trust authority, but uh, th this is, uh, I think, a pretty good idea of uh, what they see in the rocks. Suddenly, a bunch of animals, a bunch of... Um, plants disappeared, okay? And said so this event may have fragmented the forest into isolated islands, which in turn caused dwarfism and shortly after extinction of many plant and animal species, okay? Just because of the rainforest collapse. A major abrupt extinction of the dominant like lycopsids and a change uh, to tree fern dominated ecosystems. In other words, the ferns began to re replace the club mosses, uh, like lycopsids are club mosses or mosses of different kinds. Um, uh, and so the point here is that uh, we had a change in vegetation and all those animals that depended on the club mosses suddenly, you know, had trouble and they were uh, gradually uh, or relatively quickly because there was a uh, fine, uh, quick line between the um, Carboniferous and the Permian that we can distinguish in the rock, we can see something happened there and what happened was that the uh, plants and animals changed. Okay, and if uh, plants and animals change, why would you think that's the case? Uh, perhaps the food went away and the animals went away? The animals who developed a, um, a long-term relationship with those plants? And here it says, before the collapse, animal species distribution was very cosmopolitan. The same species existed everywhere across tropical Pangaea. But after the collapse, each surviving rainforest island develops, developed its own unique mix of species. Many amphibian species became extinct, while the ancestors of reptiles and mammals diversified into more species after the initial crisis. Okay. So, um, yeah, new animals replace the old ones because new plants replace the old ones. Okay, at least that's my conclusion. You can reach your own conclusion, but again, I want you to take into consideration that transition in the plant world uh, and because of that in the animal world. And remember, you know, uh, uh, plants don't go off you know, in two seconds, it takes a long time for them to vanish, you know, species wise and number wise with, you know, population wise with uh, population wise within each species. And so something was happening and it was happening gradually until it finally reached a critical point where a lot of animals 
uh, big animals, especially, you know, a lot of these amphibians could not find food and suddenly they went extinct because, you know, they, they had trouble eating, especially the herbivores uh, around there. And, you know, the whole, the whole ecological system depended on those herbivores eating the plants. So the whole uh, um, uh, food chain collapsed. And another food chain that depended on different kinds of plants, you know, they were in effect. They say, what's going on? We don't know. <laughs> the big guys are getting out of here and we're going to take over. And that's exactly what happened. Um, midway into the Permian, you get this uh, called Olson's extinction. Okay. And you can see there's a difference between the animals on the left and the ones on the right. And all these are considered mammal-like reptiles, but uh, they're a little different. Okay. The ones on the left are known as synapsids. Okay. The ones on the right, well, you have a therapsid there and a pariasaur. Okay, they're different kinds of animals. Uh, the guys on the left look more like reptiles, if you would think. But see, all these animals laid eggs, and they filled that uh, region of time called the Permian. And it says the following. It says, plants showed large turnover in the mid to late Permian and into the Triassic, the duration of higher extinction rates, greater than 60% in land plants, was about 23.4 million years, starting from Olson's extinction and into the early Middle Triassic. Olson's extinction represents the third highest peak of extinction rates seen in plants throughout the Paleozoic. And the uh, number of genera fell by 25%. The extinction was particularly severe among free sporing plants. Free sporing means that uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, sporing plants like uh, ferns and so on, that there's uh, seed ferns and also spore uh, ferns and other spore plants as well. And those were losing ground against not only, not only the seed ferns, but against another type of plant that was rising, which were the cycads and the ginkgos, okay? And these were, were going to be part of the conifer world, okay? Uh, uh, gymnosperms. Okay, so um, again, there was a turnover in plants, and this created a turnover in animals in the middle of the Permian. There was an extinction there that they cannot explain, okay? And I think we have an explanation if you open your mind to it, okay? But at least, if you don't believe it, at least you should ponder it and uh, factor it in uh, whenever you talk about extinction. Okay, what happened at the end of the Permian? That was 273 million years. Here's 252 million years ago, okay? And this is uh, one of the most popular plants uh, or types of plants that covered that whole region. You can see there, uh, South America, Africa, part of Australia, and Antarctica. And why do they know that? Well, they know that because they found these uh, Glossopteridales uh, all over that green, that dark green region. Okay, they found them in every one of those continents, and they were the southern continents. Okay, and so what happens um, the, within that? Uh, one of the most popular was this uh, uh, tree-like plant that you see on the left. Uh, it's called uh, Glossopteris, and these were these plants almost dominated the, completely the uh, the uh, landscape. In, in that southern region. It was almost the only plant that existed. In other words, uh, not only plant, but the, the order, the type of plant that existed, this was almost all there was. So what did the herbivores eat if not this? And what do you think would happen when this plant disappeared? Well, all those animals that carved niches within each part of that plant, you know, the seed, the uh, fruit, or the, it had no fruit, but it, uh, the leaves, uh, or whatever they ate from it, you know, the, the, this type of plant supported uh, a whole ecosystem. And what do you think would happen when, it, when, uh, when, uh, when all these uh, uh, plants disappeared, this type of plant disappeared? After the animals forged mil a millions of years uh, relationship with them. Well, you would think that the animals would disappear as well. And I think that's what happened. Here he says, 
Uh, Glossoptera dales is an extinct order of seed ferns, arose at the beginning of the Permian, see? Tells you the, the number, when they found these, right? On the continent of Gondwana, but became extinct before the end of the Permian period, 251.9 million years ago. And 252 is the year, uh, allegedly, when all these animals went extinct. So it just matches quite perfectly. Glossoptera dales, they covered the landscape, they disappeared, and suddenly, by sheer coincidence, the animals on land disappear as well. You figure it out. It says, these plants went on to become a, a dominant part of the southern flora through uh, the rest of the Permian. Okay, so, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you, you reach your own conclusions. All I can tell you is that um, after doing 20 years of research, that's my conclusion. Uh, it had nothing to do with volcanoes, which is one of the primary proposals today. The other one is methane coming from the seabeds, just oozing out, filling the, I mean, they have these catastrophic theories so complex that Mother Nature is, is, is shocked. <laughs> Uh, they have this uh, methane just covering the, the uh, air, uh, turning into CO2, just too much CO2 or too much methane. And uh, also because of that uh, oozing out, it covers the, you, you have to cover the whole planet, right? And that stops sunlight, you know, photosynthesis, and then a lot of plants die, and so the animals die, and, and so on and so forth. And how did the ones in the water die? Well, who knows? I mean, it, maybe the gas when it came out just killed those who could not stand it or you know it was a question of competition that's all these people talk about that's all they can think of and let me tell you why because see each one of these guys they have pet peeves and they solicit funds you know uh, to be able to carry out their um, uh, their studies their research and so I can tell you a case of Paul Wignall a British guy who uh, went to Greenland, I think it was, uh, and uh, he goes there and he looks at the uh, methane, that's what he studies, and sure enough, you know, he, he gets this money to go there on a vacation trip, he does his study, and he comes back and says, yeah, I proved it, it was methane. Oh. Surprise, surprise, you know, and the other guy who goes to see volcanoes, he comes back, no, it was volcanoes. <laughs> you know, so they all prove their foregone conclusions, and what are you going to learn from these people? You know, they, they don't have a, a mechanism that really uh, addresses the only issue an extinction theory has to address, and that is selectivity. How does Mother Nature choose this species and not that one? And more so, uh, how does Mother Nature choose chronologically? Always, in every single case, 100% of the cases, okay? Uh, what dies are the old species, and what survives are the new species. So you have this radiation of little tiny animals that are tied to the new plants that are uh, radiating and covering the landscape and muscling out the old plants. And with the old plants go the old animals, the ancient animals that have been around for too long and that were tied to the previous um, ecological uh, or to the previous plants and so now you can see why there is selectivity through food because you have one food chain that has nothing to do with the other food chain okay or at least little maybe there's some overlap there, there's always some of that but uh, in general when uh, all these animals die it's because they depend on these these sources of food and they get used to it over millions of years they're not going to switch at the last moment to something else that's something else for them those are weeds they don't eat weeds animals are smarter than that okay okay here's the Triassic okay again we have uh, these weird little animals this uh, they, they were like crocodiles but they stood like higher from the ground than a uh, normal crocodile today. And um, one of the uh, plants that was popular in those days was Dicroidium. There were others like Daniopsis and uh, Dictyophyllum. Uh, very hard to pronounce some of these uh, <laughs> plants. Well, these were uh, plants that covered the landscape. This is what there was to eat. So what else were they going to eat if this was the only thing they had to eat? I mean, there, there was no, uh, no wheat, no uh, rice in those days. There were no grasses. Uh, there were relatively few cycads and uh, ginkgos that they were just starting out. They were just expanding. Uh, this was a dry, hot um, period in uh, Earth's history. 
And so these were the plants that came out, and these were the animals that developed with respect to those plants. This is what they ate, and they ate this for millions of years. You know, it's like you eat, you eat uh, I don't know, uh, pancakes and maybe chocolate every morning because that's what you like. And suddenly someone says, look, I I've got some pine leaves for you. Would you like to eat them? <laughs> I don't think you're going to switch overnight to pine leaves from your ice cream and your chocolate and your pancakes. <laughs> okay, and so here it is. Dicroidium is an extinct genus of fork leaf seed ferns that were distributed over Gondwana during the Triassic. 252 to 201 million years ago. The flora is dominated by the seed fern Dicroidium, a morphogenous uh, that is widespread and usually dominant in middle to late Triassic plant assemblages throughout Gondwana. Yeah, th these were popular plants. This is what these animals had to eat. They had nothing else to eat but what you see there. So, so there was nothing else to eat. Don't, don't tell me, well, you know, maybe they wanted to eat something else. They wanted cake instead of ice cream. No, no, this is all they had. And so when these plants went out, what do you think would happen? And these plants did die at the end of the Triassic. So it's like, well, you know, it doesn't seem like you need to be a, you know, a rocket scientist to figure it out that food had something to do with those animals. And what continued were the dinosaurs, which were tiny animals that had grown somewhat in the past before the these archosaurs uh, that's what they were called all these crocodile like animals they dominated the landscape they were big and here were the little dinosaurs in the background you know running around like ants like uh, ants are with respect to us today or like mice or whatever and so yeah when uh, the archosaurs went away the dinosaurs could now expand and each one grab his own niche you know occupy their niches and diversify that's what happened why because now the plants diversified and you had all these different types of dinosaurs just you know uh, uh, squat some territory in some types of plants for their own use and uh, you know right behind the herbivores came the uh, predators you know they said oh uh, I like that animal <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna carve a niche within that his uh, world <laughs> okay here's the Jurassic Okay, that came next. And uh, again, same situation. Essentially, uh, I think ginkgos were one of the important ones that disappeared. Several ginkgos, only one survived to today, which is the biloba. But there were many types of ginkgos in those days, and all of them disappeared. And uh, Araucaria, there were many, many uh, types of these uh, trees that disappeared. Today we have Araucaria uh, in different parts of the world. But the types of Araucaria that uh, these animals ate probably disappeared, and with them, the big dinos, so the, the ones who depended on this source of food. And as it says here, fossils attributable to genus Ginkgo first appeared in the early Jurassic, and the genus diversified and spread throughout Laurasia. Uh, during the Middle Jurassic and early Cretaceous. It declined in diversity as the Cretaceous progressed. Yeah, I think what happened is that um, towards the end of the Jurassic, a lot of these plants, uh, you know, they, they, they have this big hump where they grow in diversity and in numbers. And then they begin their decline, okay? And then they, they don't just chop off and fall to extinction. No, it's just gradually fewer species and fewer numbers. The forest, the jungles of some of these uh, plants get smaller, they become smaller islands, smaller islands, and the animals are, you know, kind of suffering, looking for, for food. And by this time, the animals have suffered something else. You know, they, they probably uh, got used to some of the endemic diseases. They live longer, they have, uh, they, or they have kids, and uh, so they, they become numerous as, as herds, but their food sources uh, are are dwindling underneath their feet while they're becoming more numerous. What happens at some point? There's a crash. Lots of them begin to die, and uh, and uh, carnivores that prey upon them, they find the same problem because suddenly you know they they you know as they kill the herbivores, they find trouble finding food themselves. And the last part of that process is cannibalism. You you kill someone in your own tribe. Okay? You start eating. Little, big guy eats little guy sort of thing, you know, dog eat dog world. Okay, so what's next? Well, the last uh, segment here is the Cretaceous, and I've covered this in the past. 
And you can see what happened there. Uh, from the end of the Jurassic, 145 million years ago to 65 million years ago, those 80 million years, uh, starting about 130 million years ago, the angiosperms were invented. Mother Nature invented those. And suddenly, suddenly what happens, um, the angiosperms start crowding out all the other species of plants. Uh, especially all the conifers, because the conifers were uh, dominant in the Jurassic and in the Cretaceous. And suddenly the Cretaceous, now the la latter half, you could say almost, uh, started getting cr the conifers then got crowded out by the angiosperms. And for sure, you know, you can see the cycads uh, dwindled down to nothing practically. Um, ferns, uh, they had a little spike there, but you can see the diversity decreased tremendously for ferns as well. Uh, ginkgos, uh, they had uh, practically disappeared. The only one that continued is, again, uh, you know, the uh, biloba, which we have today. And again, we call it, why do we call it a uh, living fossil? Because uh, ginkgo biloba, is, is, that's the last uh, order that remains of this plant. It shows you what happens to these plants. If there were some animal that still lived on, on ginkgo, you know, that animal would be dead, uh, practically. He'd have a hard time finding ginkgos out there because you don't find ginkgo plants uh, on, the, on the planet. Uh, you know, they're not very popular. And so even though there are ginkgos and some animal who would have found them would have continued living, the point here is that when that whole jungle of ginkgos collapsed, a lot of animals went with it. And maybe there were ginkgos on the other side of the planet. It didn't matter to those animals. You know, they, they, they were dead. They, they had no food. And so this is what happens. Uh, food disappears, the animal disappears. Very simple mass extinction there. I mean, to understand it. Okay. Um, what died at the Cretaceous here? I put a little uh, uh, synopsis there. Uh, the large forums died in the uh, seas, and what's the uh, survived were tiny forums that were coming up. And again, here you have the same situation. You have the uh, the little mammals and the uh, big dinosaurs. That's more or less the situation there. Okay, uh, the it's the big forums, the ones that had been around for a long time. They had uh, evolved to a point where they were giants. And those, it was time, uh, their time was up. And what continued were the small forums, which were essentially, you know, had nothing to do with the old forums. Uh, these people, these uh, animals took over the, uh, that same niche. And at the bottom, you see good old Triceratops. And again, it's the ancient species that disappeared. What survived were the new animals. There you see a little uh, rat-like animal, and you see a monkey. Monkey came a lot later, okay? But the point is, what survived were the mammals. Why? Because they were hiding in the, uh, in the wings, uh, almost waiting for the uh, dinosaurs to go away. Uh, so today you have this ridiculous notion that uh, a lot of paleontologists say professionals, you know, scientists as they call them, and they say that, you know, if it weren't for that lucky asteroid, you know, the uh, dinosaurs would still be around. We wouldn't be here. Unbelievable. No, no, uh, dinosaurs were guaranteed because they were big. Uh, they were not going to evolve any longer. They had, they had reached their maximum extent. And we're more or less in the same boat, okay? Okay, and here's uh, another snapshot of that same uh, idea. You have the, gi the giants were the ones who disappeared. You have the gigantic uh, Quetzalcoatlus, uh, the Mosasaurs on the, in the waters, and the T-Rexes on land. It's the big guys that disappeared. And they were all old. That's why they were big, because they had millions of years of evolution to make them bigger. They, uh, what is known as Cope's Law. Uh, over time, uh, animals grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Humans have done that as well. You know, we're the biggest humans that ever lived in this day and age. And what survived, uh, again, were the birds, the, some of the reptiles, uh, mammals, you know, those are what survived. Okay? But primarily what the old species were, the ones that uh, went away. And, you know, you can't, you can't explain that with an asteroid. Asteroids are not intelligent enough to distinguish between <laughs> the archaic uh, species and the new, the up-and-coming, you know, the 
upwardly mobile <laughs> species okay they, they don't have that ability to discern and just in case uh, you still wondering uh, here we have good old uh, Alvarez the Alvarez uh, uh, pushed the asteroid theory what do they say this is from their paper okay 1980 uh, seminal paper because this is where they they got the idea of the asteroid and today it's it's the idea pushed by all paleontologists essentially 40 years now of this. It says, in brief, our hypothesis suggests that an asteroid struck the Earth, formed an impact crater, and some of the dust-sized material ejected from the crater reached the stratosphere and was spread around the globe. Why? Because it covered, you, you need to cover the globe with dust. That stops the sunlight, right? This dust effectively prevented sunlight from reaching the surface for a period of several years. Several years. That means plants are going to die, right? And as a result, most food chains, collab uh, chains collapsed. So there you have, he, he's saying it's the food chain, right? And that's the seminal paper. Food chain, that's what he's talking about. And, uh, and the extinctions resulted. So extinctions resulted from food chain collapse. Now they have to uh, explain, you know, why some animals survive. Because if, if you have this um, dust that covers the entire planet and the plants die, for several years, what did the mammals eat? What did the uh, other animals eat? Uh, you know, uh, like uh, in in the waters. And it's like they don't pay attention to. It's like they brush over and say, "Well, we got a theory. We can't explain all the uh, aspects." No, you cannot explain anything. You cannot. You did not explain selectivity. So, so this is an idiotic theory because it doesn't explain selectivity. That's why it should should be discarded. If they can't explain selectivity, I don't care if an asteroid hit the Earth or not. It has nothing to do with the extinction. They haven't explained the process. Instead, they went out there and looked for evidence. You know, all mathematical physics and all this, they, they, they rely on evidence. They believe in evidence. So they say, let's look for evidence. And sure enough, they found uh, a place in Chicxulub uh, in uh, Mexico, in the Yucatan uh, region there. And they say, oh, an asteroid hit here. Well, first of all, I'm not sure that's an asteroid. I'm not convinced. I looked at it. Doesn't look like an asteroid uh, in a crater to me, especially the part on land because there's half of it is in the land, half of it is in the sea. And the part on land doesn't even look like a, a crater. You look at craters, if you look at old craters, they look like craters. That one doesn't look like a crater. But they had to turn it into a crater so that this theory could have a chance. And even if the theory has a chance because of the crater, they still haven't explained selectivity. Okay, so you might say, well, what does, uh, what does all this have to do with the extinction of man? Why do we have to go through all this stun, uh, stuff? Well, again, what I'm saying here is you got to take extinction 101. You have to tell me how the animals in the past died before you get to man. Because Mother Nature is not so sophisticated. She doesn't have different mechanisms for uh, for different species and she doesn't have or habitats for that matter and she doesn't have uh, a different mechanism for the different ages she doesn't do volcanoes in the Permian and uh, asteroids in the um, in the Cretaceous especially because none of them can explain selectivity and none of them for sure can explain chronological selectivity that what died were the big animals why did the big animals die well because they were already well developed, completely developed. And why were they developed? Because they developed, they uh, evolved with the plants in which they carved a niche. That's why. So what are we saying? I'm saying that if all these animals died, you know, if you take the Carboniferous amphibians, they died because of food. Uh, Permian, they died because of food. Triassic, they died because of food. You know, starvation, uh, their, their sources of food ran out. Dinosaurs, Jurassic, dinosaurs, Cretaceous, also food sources ran out. Well, uh, there seems like there's a pattern there. It seems like a cookie cutter to me. And so if we apply that to man, can man avoid starvation, running out of food? Especially when, when uh, we produce this food only because of money, because of our economy for 8 billion people? I mean, it's very simple. It just bring God with his magic wand. I don't care. And you wipe out all the money in the planet, okay? All the zeros 
and the ones from the computers, right? No, no bank accounts, no money, uh, and pe or, or just uh, waves his magic wand and people have no faith in money anymore, right? Whatever. The point is, if we eliminate money altogether for whatever reason today, right? Uh, don't you think that would affect the production of food, the planning of food, the distribution of food? I mean, if we don't get a computer, we don't get a car, we don't get a, a ship or an airplane, well, so what? You know, here we had 30 million people unemployed in, in the United States. Nobody, nobody suffered. You know, uh, you, you can still go to the store, get food, no problem. You, you haven't even noticed uh, other than the fact that you can't go to a restaurant. Okay? So we don't need those jobs. They were unemployed uh, before they got unemployed. <laughs> but uh, the point here I'm trying to make is, you know, if, if, uh, if food disappears, if, if money disappears, food disappears. If food disappears, well, I can guarantee that you're going to die. So all I can say is that at least, uh, you know, if food disappears, that's a good uh, mechanism for extinction, for at least for your extinction, your personal extinction. You can't live without food. So that is something you should consider, especially when uh, people like Alvarez also go to the food chain to make their case. So food is something you got to think about. And so here's the challenge for you. Uh, homework, okay? Homework, and it's a challenge for anyone who wants to take over. So please listen carefully, okay? I don't want you telling me why man's not going to disappear because of food or because the economy collapses. I want you to do it in reverse, okay? You don't have to believe I want you to come up with a mechanism. Let's assume you wanted to kill man through starvation. Just assume that. You don't have to believe in it. All you have to do is make an assumption and say, look, let's say I wanted to kill humanity. Okay? You're God here, right? How would you go about it uh, short of miracles? I mean, I, you, you can make your magic wand move around and say, all, all food disappears. Now, that's too simple. And I, I, you need to think a little bit, okay? You got to make it difficult on you. I propose money disappears, food disappears. The other day we had Guy McPherson. I uh, covered his, uh, his uh, proposal, which is climate change, and then food disappears. He also is a food disappearing guy, but he does it through climate. I do it through the economy. Here's the ball in your court. Now you do it. Let's assume you wanted to kill man through starvation, through the food chain. Okay? How would you go about doing it? Come up with a mechanism, see if you can invent one, see if you can come up with one, okay? And uh, hopefully that'll get your mind working to see, you know, what things could be involved in, in uh, man's disappearance due to food, okay? So all I can say is come up with a mechanism. And you can't use money because I'm the guy who already came up with that, so you can't come up with it again. And we have uh, Mr. Uh, guy McPherson and his buddies and they say it's climate change, okay, and so uh, you can't come up with that one. They already came up with that one, so you got to come up with a third one, okay? Something else. How would you kill man through the food cycle, assuming you wanted to kill man? Okay? And with that, I'll see you next time, hopefully on Sunday, and maybe we'll continue with a little bit of this. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.